edition of Men Matter. We are very fortunate to have with us Professor James Giordano, Ph.D., Director of the Center for Neurotechnology Studies and Vice President for Academic Programs at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies in Arlington, Virginia. He is a Fulbright Professor of Neuroscience, Neurotechnology, and Ethics at the Human Science Center of the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany, as well as a Research Professor of Neurosciences and Ethics in the Department of Electrical and Computational Engineering, University of New Mexico at Albuquerque. He is the chair of the National Neurosciences Ethics, Legal, and Social Issues Initiative and has published over 170 publications in neuroscience, philosophy, and ethics. His recent books include Advances in Neurotechnology, Premises, Potential, and Problems, and Maldinia, Multidisciplinary Perspectives on the Illness of Chronic Pain, as well as Pain, Mind, Meaning, and Medicine, and Pain Medicine, Philosophy, Ethics, and Policy. His ongoing research addresses the use of advanced neurotechnologies to explore neuroscience of pain and neuropsychiatric spectrum disorders and the neuroethical issues arising in and from the use of neuroscience and neurotechnology in research, medicine, public life, national security, and defense. Dr. Giordano, welcome. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for being on. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure both to talk with you and to speak with our audience. You and I spoke before, and uh, I think uh, and a lot of the public and uh, a lot of listeners are concerned about recent events in the world, but I think a good place to start here is, and I certainly don't have uh, the depth that you do, could you give us an explanation of the concept of and the field of neuroethics? Absolutely. You know, if we look back over the past 25 years, 30 years, the field has particularly come to be regarded as neuroscience, the brain sciences, have really come together in, in a crucible of interdisciplinary thought, use of various techniques, tools, and technologies that in some ways have spawned new theories, in other ways have generated new approaches, new methodologies, and even new tools, brain technologies, neurotechnologies. These don't exist in a social or public vacuum. They exist as part of society, nested within the world stage. And, you know, in many ways, these techniques, technologies, these approaches, even the the general research agenda itself is probing at something that is precipitously important for the human condition. It looks at what we are. It looks at the human being, not in isolation. Certainly, it looks at organisms that have nervous systems that have brains that in some way may and very often do, or likely do, instantiate some form of consciousness in the thing that we call mind. That's profound. That's a philosophical question as much as a very practical set of applications. But how we regard things that have a brain and are a mind, that manifest consciousness, some idea of free will, then also gives rise to a whole host of moral, ethical, legal, and social issues, questions, dilemmas, problems, and potential resolutions. And of course, we can also use neuroscience and its technologies to probe the way we think, uh, to probe the way we create various cognitions that help us to interact and intuit with each other and our relationships and perhaps what we call morality. That being the case, we can then nest within that reality, this field, neuroethics. The term was first used by philosopher Adina Rothkies in the late 1970s, and it was primarily used within academic circles to define the general ideas of utilizing neuroscientific approaches to study morality and also to address some of the issues that occur in neuroscientific research and its applications. What Adina Rosky did a very, very good job of doing is defining what we continue to call, and I'm very, very fond of referring to as the two primary traditions of this field this profession and its practices, neuroethics. The first is really the neuroscientific and neurological studies of brain mechanisms of morality, proto-morality and human ecological behavior and even perhaps other species potential for moral and even ethical interactions. The second tradition refers to those ethical issues, problems, questions, that are fostered by the use of neuroscientific research and its tools and technologies 
and their various applications in healthcare and public life, and as you well mentioned, even national security, global relations, and international defense. So we see neuroethics as a field that does two things. Number one, it, it can serve as a lens into the way organisms that have a brain and manifest a mind then create their notions of relationality and morality that become systematized ethics. And it can also be both a lens and a mirror to then re-examine the way we, humans, engage neuroscience and its tools as a human endeavor to affect our healthcare, our relations with others, inclusive other people, other species, and may in fact be also utilized by a variety of social agenda, inclusive of public life, daily interactions, economics, and national defense. That's a very complete explanation. I think it's also easy to follow because uh, although very, very specifically addressed using the language of neuroethics, I think you've hit on what the majority of the public sometimes goes through their mind on these various topics. When things occur in the public eye that produce very emotional response, the recent tragedies certainly come to mind in Wisconsin as well as Colorado and hit on something that I think might be a good intro for the use and application of this in the public venue, which is where most of the attention is focused now. But I think most folks want to know where is the line between the application and the predictive value, if you can call it that, of neuroethics, neuro research, versus, in so many words, Big Brother getting inside our heads. I think that may be an overstatement, but I think that a lot of people fear something they don't know and the concept of control, free will, free choice, as you addressed. How do we address that to people? One, from don't be afraid of this. And two, where is a practical application likely to spur more attention and confidence in this field? You've opened the proverbial Pandora's box of neuroscience, neurotechnology, and neuroethics, and I'm really glad you did. Your first comment about let's teach people not to be afraid of this, I want to add something to that. I think what's important is that we really need to communicate two things. Number one, a deep and abiding respect for the fact that neuroscience and neurotechnology can be very, very potent tools in terms of the way they're used, and also in terms of the way they may be misused or, frankly, abused. The second point there is that despite the fact that we've made some wonderful advances and that the field has made ardent strides in the past 10 and even five years, there really is a lot of things with neuroscience and neurotechnology that cannot be done. There are some fundamental questions about the way brains work to create minds that remain unknown, These are sometimes referred to as the proverbial hard problems or hard questions of neuroscience. We simply don't know how the gray stuff of the brain makes the great stuff of the mind. And this is a huge information gap that also incurs particular practicality gaps. Uh, We can do certain things to the brain and in the brain, but we may not necessarily be knowing exactly what it is we're doing. There's a gap. So understanding every one of those little steps between A, B, C, onto Z we may not understand them all, so we have to sort of trust in our bridging these gaps with current levels of understanding that may be limited. The other issue that I think is very, very important is that these days, you know, the public can't open a magazine, can't look on TV without either seeing some image of this is what your brain looks like when it does A, B, and C, or uh, this is your brain on drugs, this is your brain in love. And There's very sophisticated technology that goes behind brain imaging and the use of various other forms of assessing brain function. And, of course, there's just as much art as there is science in that. There are a lot of limitations there as well. And I think one of the things we need to be very, very careful of is something that uh, my, my colleague, the philosopher Roger Scruton from the University of Oxford and St. Andrews University in Scotland, has I think, very astutely referred to as neuro-nonsense. Indeed, uh, there are a a number of limitations to this field. And very often, what will happen is uh, these results of neuroscientific research will become part of the media, 
And in even an attempt to simplify it for a public venue or in an attempt to perhaps gain some impact as a potential profundity of the research or its trajectories of potential use, the, the boundaries of what is what I would call hard neuroscience become a little mollified and this then becomes soft neuroscience. It becomes a bit of hype. We have to recall there's a lot of things these techniques and technologies cannot do. And take that with a pretty good measure of appreciation and respect for the fact that there are a lot of things that technologies can do, and there are even more things that the public in various societies, administrations, organizations want this neuroscience and neurotechnology to do. This is hopeful use as much as it is pragmatic use. And this then gets us into your second question, which is then bridging those gaps, or at least appreciating the gaps and acknowledging the realities of what we can do with neuroscience and its techniques and technologies, what we can't do, and what we should do in between. So if we begin to discuss some of those things, I think that you've hit on a very interesting point. Then you have instances such as uh, Columbine, Wisconsin, Colorado. Uh, the public is, is stimulated. They're, they're aroused to turn to neuroscience, neurotechnology, and those of us who do neuroethics, and say, do something. Why can't you do something with this technology? Can't you predict this? Can't you stop this? And in some ways, the answer is, yeah, there are a number of things that can be done to be able to afford some level of prediction, but this is speculative. The other issue is, well, can you really assemble sufficient enough neuroscientific and neurotechnological data about someone or a group of people to be able to then ethically inform the law to be able to intercede and intervene before some activity or perhaps even crime has been committed. And if you, if you sniff deeply here, this has a minority report sniff to it. So this is a, a, an interesting balancing act between scientific capability and technological competency. And some of the limitations we have with regard to translating what science can do and what technologies can achieve into the realm of the legal. So the other question that arises here is, well, we sort of want neuroscience and neurotechnology to provide relative protections for our security and at the same time, perhaps advance human flourishing. We like that. Of course, the other side of that coin is that we also want our libertarian freedoms and want to hold on to those values very, very strongly as part of our protective public and inalienable rights. How do we navigate that center line? Uh, this is what neuroethics and this uh, larger project called NELSI, which is Neuroethics, Legal, and Social Issues, agendas are explicitly dedicated to doing. So I think one of the things we, we might want to do uh, for the public is address some of the different types of neuroscientific and neurotechnological approaches and just generally describe what they what they can do, what they're aimed at doing, and what some of the limitations may be as well, at least in broad terms, help your, your listening audience to better orient towards the reality of what the field is all about. Would that be of interest? Uh, it would, and I think that uh, to capsulize that, if I might, I'm not trying to diminish uh, uh, the volume that you gave, and I think that's that's a very excellent explanation. Uh, often people need to hear something like that to say, yeah, that's what I meant to say. Uh, what approaches are being most often used or what do you feel are the most valuable ones right now to, one, conduct neuroscience research for uh, a practical use in the sense that it'll be as you say, in a legal application or a personal health versus a mental health uh, arena, how is this approachable to the public in a sense that they don't feel, as we said before, the big brotherish? Because I realize people are always welcome to watch various scientific programs on, oh, look at this wonderful research into Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or dementia or certain neurobiological uh, states that... Uh, Disease, uh, disease often comes to the fore, uh, and people are very interested in how that process works. When it encroaches, as you said, into free will or where do our choices become identifiable and as you, minority report things, so to speak, uh, where do we say 
here's a practical application and you should be comfortable with this and it will help us but that gray zone of predictability stop it is there a, what's the most practical research means to come up with practical applications acceptable practical applications for the public sure there are really three questions in one as i hear it and please correct me if i'm wrong what is the, the neuroscience research agendas that are translatable into medical use, public use, and perhaps even defense and legal use? And then of these dimensions, how does, how does the public really, how can the public really navigate this groundswell of information that's coming up to be able to say these are the things that really seem to be the most viable and have the most what I would call protective or, or valuable resource for various aspects of the public, their, their health, their security, their protection, their flourishing. Did that synopsize the question pretty well? It does. And the third thing I think to enhance on that is um, I think a lot of folks, and I even see it in my own practice where people worry about, for instance, side effects of medications, et cetera. Um, sure. And to capsulize that would be, I think people are afraid in general as technology advances and, and so much is being learned. Perhaps a base question, are, are we predictable? That's a good thing. But in the same spectrum, are we controllable? Which is a scary thing. Wonderful. And I think that's the perfect leading actually to our first question, which are what are the domains of neuroscience and neurotechnology that has, I would say, the best throughput for application? In general, what I think would be a good thing to equate the listening audience to is the fact that we're really dealing with two major families of neuroscientific and neurotechnological interventions or, or approaches. The first are what we call assessment neurosciences and neurotechnologies. They're really geared toward assessing brain function and nerve function. In this broad category, you find different forms of neuroimaging, and these are very, very popular, just both in terms of their, their potential utility and also their limitations right now. So you see, see things like uh, functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, single photon emission computerized tomography, what is referred to as SPECT, positron emission tomography, which is known as PET, computerized tomography or CT scanning. We had different forms of being able to physiologically assess the electrical activities of the brain using a basic technique known as encephalography and some of the more sophisticated forms of encephalography that utilize a resonant magnetic current, which is called magnetoencephalography, and being able to then quantify some of these encephalographic electrical readings in a quantifiable or quantifiable EEG form, a QEEG form. And we can use these assessment techniques alone as singular modalities. And it's when we use them in that way that we tend to find the limitations really come up and smack us in the face. Uh, functional MRI, for example, doesn't really give a, a real clear time signal of what's going on in the brain. The, the pictures can be very, very pretty and very articulate, but it doesn't really respond in real what we call brain or nerve time. There's very often a, a time delay that not a good representative image. On the other hand, some of the encephalographic techniques, the EEG-based techniques, for example, are very accurate with regard to their time signal, but they're a little more vague with regard to their spatial sensitivity of what's going on in various regions and networks of the brain. So if we put these things together, you see we get a combinatory effect that's much more clear, much more salient, I think is much more reliable and, and valid. And we just don't use those types of things alone either. We can also then harness these to neurogenetics. That's looking at both the human genome for those genes that will code particular brain proteins and brain structures and functions, and then looking at this on an individual level, individual neurogenetics, not just genomics, and then going one step further to examine individual patterns of neurochemistry and then linking that to behavior. And very often, these are the things that are widely used in experimental and even now parts of clinical psychiatry and neurology. These are used to assess brain function. Now, what comes jumping out here is that the big elephant in the room, the gazillion dollar question, is these are not just depictive could these also perhaps be predictive? Could we use these assessments in ways that are not just looking at the here and now, or perhaps even what has occurred in the past in this particular individual's neurological history, 
but could these be indicative of patterns, types, characterologies, for example, of potential behaviors that may occur if we use these neuroscientific and neurotechnological assessments, either as a group of them taken together, or if we then begin to map these to things like behavioral patterns, psychological patterns, family patterns, and then utilize cyber technology, computational record keeping, and large-scale data banks to be able to indicate that there is a probabilistic ratio of someone has characteristics A, B, and C will likely then do or become D, E, and F. So this is the question that looms very, very large, both, I think, on the lips of the present, uh, what neuroscientists are dealing with and what the public may see, and also on the horizon of possibility of where this neuroscience and these neurotechnologies may go. The question is, how, in fact, should we utilize these technologies, and can we do this in a way that is not only scientifically possible, but is it really, number one, valid, and number two, can we uphold that validity to an extent so as to make it of some legal or social value, rather than corrupting it in a way that is big brotherish, that has sort of overtones of some administrative or governmental control of saying, well, we predict that you're going to be this or do that, and as a result, we'll then have to act on that before these things even occur. That's more than a gray zone. That's a schism. That could potentially be an ethical legal abyss. So part of the, the mission, part of the agenda here, is to be able to delve ever deeper into the neuroscience to make certainties as to what it is we're really assessing, how we're really assessing it, and to really, really test the validities, the veridicalities, the reliability of this information to not only be descriptive and definitive, but to assess its predictive value, and certainly to extend that from the scientific into the ethical and from the ethical into the legal because the power that can be leveraged from this and the responsibility that goes along with that is tremendous, which gets me to my second point. The other domain of neuroscientific and neurotechnological possibility is what we call interventional neuroscience and technology. If we think of the former as being to assess what's going on in the brain, and perhaps by extension, although a a, a very severe extension, being able to predict what brains minds and people will do, so-called mind reading, if you will, or behavioral reading or patterning, can we then use those same neurological mechanisms that we've identified as targets for intervention with things like specific drugs, perhaps even non-specific drugs, the use of brain implants, the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation. In other words, once we identify particular neurological mechanisms that may be involved in cognitions, emotions, or behaviors that we define to be socially, individually, medically problematic, can we then use these other neurotechnologies to mitigate or in some cases even prevent these thoughts, these feelings, and these actions? So we can see the the huge power that is both purchased and leverageable through the idea of intervening on that level because it gets down to the fundamental questions of what makes me me? Is this a level of intervening at the neurological scale to affect affect individuals' determinism and will? Is there some level of protection that should be afforded, for example, by medicine and the law? Or, in fact, do these represent viable insights that are the next step into being able to profile, predict, assess in ways that can be used ethically, can be used with legal soundness. And how do we develop those ethical and legal approaches? And and that's really what we're struggling with today. Um, And that's an excellent description of, uh, I think, the major topics that if you will, tabletop discussion that people have, and sometimes I have with uh, patients as well, particularly when you were doing mental health assessments or mental health issues, or or later on, um, aging brain concepts and uh, how that influences us socially, familiarly, personally. Um, if I, am I, 
I'm, I'm not trying to make it too simple, perhaps, for the audience, or certainly not for uh, for you. Are we are we talking about nature versus nurture at some point? That with regard to predictability or even application, that is to say, when you breach on the legal aspect, for instance, oh, this person did this, but rather than the nebulous, uh, he's clinically insane as an opinion from someone, we have this scan, these tests, and this, if you will, software or predictive patterning uh, uh, software, where this was an either inevitable or a non-choice circumstance where someone commits an act or is involved in something where we think, why didn't somebody stop this? Is this nurture nature that we're kind of boiling this down to? This is such a great question. And if, if I may, let me cut quickly to the chase. I think one of the things that neuroscience, together with other areas of the bioscience, has been able to do is to revise the nature-nurture question into a statement. It's not nature or nurture. It's nature via nurture. What we're now recognizing is that humans are biopsychosocial and that our biology, our nature, provides a blueprint. And it can be a very strong blueprint that affords a foundation upon which our sociological and anthropological, inclusive, economic, political, social interactions, then shape, build, modify, and direct. And this is not just limited to the womb or early experiences. We modify that idea. In fact, what we find is that opportunistic window for biological and environmental interaction extends throughout the lifespan, which has opened up whole new vistas for the way we may be able to use these assessment neuroscientific and neurotechnological tools to be able to gain better insight into what biological factors of the brain and its functions are interacted with various environmental factors, directionally, bidirectionally, indirectly. And this has really painted an entirely new picture of the dynamic relationship that exists between our biology and our environments. And clearly, this has tremendous implications for how we modify our environments to affect our behaviors, our thoughts, our emotions, etc. So this is very, very important because I think what this has done in many ways is turn the page into a whole new chapter on how we look at ourselves and our interaction with each other in our environments. And neuroscience has played at least some role in doing that. In that vein, is there current research that you're doing or a direction that may uh, be getting quite a bit of attention with regard to the nurture via, excuse me, nature via nurture? Are we, as a species perhaps, or neurologically as a species, are we, and we know we are behaviorally influenced by social forces, social change, et cetera, but perhaps to extrapolate too much, I don't know if that's in this vein, if that's uh, if too much is uh, a statement that can be made, I think it could possibly be. Can we at some point say social forces, societal changes, et cetera, technology, are we influencing human brain structure, that hard wiring? Are we changing? Is this sort of a, I'm not trying to move too far ahead. Is this a, a an evolutionary change with regard to how we handle information and, intera and interact with each other. Again, I think with this, this opens a tremendous new realm of vistas. One of the things that our group here at the Center for Neurotechnology Studies and also our group in Munich at the Human Sciences Center is really looking at is the concept of the human in transition rather than looking at the human being along a somewhat more dogmatically fixed line that says, well, this is the human as static, non-changing. We look at this in a more anthropological realm, which I think takes into account that humans are evolving. And one way that humans are evolving is via the environments and all of the accoutrements and artifacts that we create, science and technology being one of them, neuroscience and technology being one of those. So one way to look at it is to draw the arrows in both directions. 
what we create as those things that we have nurtured, our own environments, our own social spheres, our own pressures, uh, media, social dynamics, feedback onto us both individually as embodied brains that manifest minds and communally in, in groups and communities and populations and perhaps even on a more species scale. So what we really are seeing is this progressive and iterative dynamic change in the human condition, the human predicament, and arguably the human being, inclusive of the brain as a consequence of the environments that we make, that we respond to, and of those approaches in science, technology, etc., that we then apply in those environments and to ourselves. So it is, in the strictest sense, a complex dynamic relationship. And to bring that question over the finish line, so to speak, I think one of the things we're seeing is the patterns of brain activity and the way that humans engage in their various cognitive approaches and their emotional and behavioral approaches also develops and changes along with each iteration of these new environments and all of the new tools that we have therein. The, the cognitive scientist and philosopher Merlin Donald, for example, has done a very nice job in, in tracing what he feels is the paleoarchaeology of human cognition, the, the developmental time course, the trajectory of human cognition. And what he sees is the next frontier that is being actualized now is the harnessing of technology to develop the way the human brain and mind actually work. And, of course, we can see that in the use of our communicative artifacts, telephones, uh, television, radio, and, of course, more recently, the computer, and more recently still, the, the social media that is becoming ever more small, ever more portable, that in many ways is making us what has been proverbially referred to as a cyborg, in the strictest sense of the word, that we're embodying our own technology and making it an inextricable part of ourselves, either physiologically, psychologically, and or even behaviorally and socially. And this, I think, speaks volumes for the way our, our nervous systems and brains will in fact develop, function, and will be interyoked to each other through the use of these technologies, which then, of course, takes us right back to the question that started the entire discourse, is that could this be utopian, could this be dystopian, and how do we walk the line down the middle to create a balanced approach to maintain the benefit and lessen the burdens? And, and that's an excellent point, one that I've actually had discussions with with people, um, particularly the uh, items that are appearing in both uh, perhaps, uh, and not as much as I've uh, read in medicine, but psychological, psychiatric, and even social media, uh, that perhaps we are already, to a degree, cyborgs, particularly the generation following behind those of us in the plus 40 crowd who don't really see technology as this new arrival but it was there when they arrived, and it's just the same as any other tool, a fork, a tree, an apple, a road, that it's just a part of things. So in a sense, we're, as far as our social, our social acceptance of it, to a degree, younger generations are already potentially accepting of a cyborg status, in our words, but may not see it as such, may not see it as something abnormal, but rather oh, this is how I'm going to use to get ahead. Uh, things will be good for me. I can interact and interface and intermingle with this technology and not feel threatened by it. Is this, is this going to be a time passage thing as people become immersed in it from an earlier age and as technology advances, they will. It becomes more accepting as not scary, but necessary. To, to simply drop a metaphor or for an analogy, if we look daily in the mirror, we tend not to see ourselves change. Uh, furthermore, if, if we are, quote, born a particular way, we view that as the selfness of ourselves. We can take a look at the same thing socially with regard to science and technology, and I'll ground it to neuroscience and technology. Uh, the contemporary generation, the generations of the 20th century, embrace science and technology as the reality of the world. I think the idea of the 20th century as being the century of technology coming after the Industrial Revolution 
is a very realistic depiction of what our social anthropology is all about for the Dick the century that was, for example, 1900 to 2000. For those latter decades, from about 1960 onward, there was a definitive focus ever more on medicine, the mind, and what that means. A resurgence, for example, in psychiatry, the actual coining of the term cyborg in 1962, 1963, the idea of the machine self being advanced through the computer generation. Obviously, as we moved into the latter part of the 20th century, what we're seeing ever more is that the final frontier exists within ourselves, the capacity of the human brain, human mind. Certainly, we saw that in the United States during the congressionally declared decade of the brain. Uh, our group has worked to reappropriate some of that international think tank atmosphere towards a decade of the mind. And I think one of the things that, that you're seeing is that as we move ahead, a number of different governmental agencies, both here in the United States as well as internationally, have really turned their attention to neuroscience and neurotechnology as an out-of-the-box game changer. Uh, in the social scale, and in international relations, in medicine, and even in the capacity for how we might wage war. So I think, arguably, I agree with uh, my, my friend and colleague, the futurist, Dr. James Canton, who has said that what we're really seeing is a, a neurocentric future. And I would agree with that. I think that what we really are seeing is that if the 20th century was the century of science and technology, the 21st century will be ever more uh, the century that looks at the way our brains process information and the way we can engineer that information, which then brings together genetics, nanoscience, cyber science, into a much more unified and convergent field, all of which focuses on what we are, what makes us think, and, and what is the nature of our being. So neuroscience may be seen in many ways as the, as the point of that pencil that's writing our new futures. I can tell you from my own experience that my students at the university and those that I deal with in a variety of different seminars and symposia that I give are exactly as you said. There is a, a relative acquiescence, uh, taking advantage of the fact that science and technology is their world. It represents the zeitgeist of what they are. And what I find ever more, and very interesting, is that neuroscience and neurotechnology is equally prominent as being something we're sort of taking for granted as a set of techniques, methods, tools, and worldview by which we're able to view ourselves, view others, and I think increasingly then create from that moral, social, and legal distinctions about how we should regard others and how we should treat others and how we should use the science and technology in the social sphere. And that's fascinating because that in many ways then takes us back to our fears and our apprehensions as well as our aspirations and our goals. Um, an excellent point, and I guess to continue that one section of what you just said, what are some, in your view, what are some recent observations or, if you will, discoveries that uh, might be practical or applicable in the current or, or, recent or uh, near future that we might see as a benefit of pursuing this type of research more, thus make it more acceptable to have it done and to see it applied by members of society? If we, if we unscrew the lid of the, sort of the bell jar of neuroscientific and neurotechnological research, there are a number of things that immediately come popping right out, They're sort of like that old you know, snakes in the can kind of thing, look what pops right out. One of the things that, that many neuroscientific research groups are doing in a very, very recent paper that just appeared in the journal Nature suggests that the, the single electrical activity, the, the aberrant micro, microcircuitry of the brain that's aberrant or what's not aberrant has great resonance effect for the way the entire brain works. Now, that may seem like a really small finding, but it's not. Because what it suggests, of course, is that the idea of nerves working together, and we're talking billions of them, in the way they balance the electrical chemical relationships of the way they function, has really great import for the way our minds work. 
And this may be one of the proverbial, quote, missing links that allows us to go from the subcellular all the way up to the social with regard to what constitutes function or dysfunction, order or disorder, wellness or illness in the way the brain works to create the mind, to create the self, to create our social beings. And this has tremendous implications for our social behavior, for psychiatry and psychology, for our interrelations with each other. So this is one of the areas I think that really may provide something of a Rosetta Stone that allows us to interpret the proverbial language of the brain-mind that helps us to steer our way forward and understand different patterns of neurological function. Now, interestingly, that may also help us to develop new tools. And one of the things that I think is very, very important for the listening audience to understand is that neuroscience and neurotechnologies make their advances through the interaction of theories and tools. We have particular tools, techniques, methods at our disposal, and some of them are great. And we can link them together in certain ways, and that allows us to revise old theories, make new theories, and prove certain facts, some of which stand the test of time, some of which don't. But then as we develop those new theories and gain new factual information, we can then build more sophisticated tools that allows us to assess the brain-mind even further and then ultimately to intervene in some ways to harness and other ways to perhaps control the brain-mind in ways that are important to medicine, in ways that are important to our public life, our social life, our interactions, and perhaps even in ways that may be potentially weaponizable for agendas of national security, defense, and warfare. So I think those are the snakes that are sort of popping out of the jar right now that I think are very, very important, How we also how we link some of these different neurotechnologies together to be able to get a much more finely grained, much more clear picture of the way the brain is working from the level of the synaptic scale all the way to the level of the systemic scale. This is very, very fascinating. So I see that this may, in fact, precipitate advancement, change in the way we approach things like psychiatry. In fact, as you and as a physician, and certainly as I'm sure much of the listening audience may be aware, the American Psychiatric Association is poised to release the brand newest edition, the fifth edition of their diagnostic manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This right. is poised to be released in 2013. This will have a huge ripple effect, you know, because one of the things it'll do is it'll reclassify a number of psychiatric conditions, uh, classifying some things as more normal than they were before and classifying other things as disordered and abnormal. Well, this is not just medical, this is obviously also social. But one of the things that this new edition strives to do is to rely at least implicitly upon the groundswell of neuroscientific and biological information that's been afforded over the past 20 years. So increasingly what we're seeing is a turn to neuroscience and its methods and its techniques to be used in ways that are both diagnostic and in ways that are therapeutic within psychiatry, which then spills over into other areas of medicine. Which gets us back to a question that you asked a couple of minutes ago, and I'd like to really return to it if I could. And that's the question of informing patients. A lot of these techniques and technologies are brand new. And as such, they, they, they smack of that newness. You know, I think there's an excitement there. But those are also potential causes for worry. Can patients know enough? Can clinicians know enough? Is the research mature enough to translate into clinical care? In many ways, we want that to be the case because many of these technologies offer, if not great hope, certainly real potential value for the treatment of heretofore intractable neurological and even psychiatric conditions. Uh, you mentioned before, and very rightly so, Parkinson's disorder, certain forms of dementia, inclusive of Alzheimer's dementia, perhaps certain manifestations of Huntington's disease other forms of neurological, motor, emotional, and degenerative disorders, and certainly a host of psychiatric conditions, inclusive of things like depression, certain forms of anxiety, and the difficulty we're facing with being able to treat psychosis in the schizophreniform disorders, schizophrenia and the like. 
So there's great hope here. My own field, one area that I've spent a uh, bulk of my clinical and basic research time has been in pain care. Can we, in fact, harness our understanding of the nervous system in the brain so as to develop more effective therapeutics against pain, mitigate pain, in some cases, prevent pain altogether, perhaps even eliminate pain in a way that is more broadly socially applicable and do so without adverse side effects that we know can occur through the use of opioids and using a number of drugs together with risk of addiction and all the host of adverse effects that cascade along. All of these things are on the horizon of not only possibility, but of reality. Many of these things are currently available to us right now. And, and the question is not so much if we can do these, because the answer to that question is, yes, we can, to a greater or lesser extent. The question is, how should we proceed? What is enough information to be able to enable physicians and empower patients to retain their autonomy? How much information is enough given that this is a relatively new set of methods and technologies? Are we willing to take some of those risks and accept them freely or create real institutional responsibilities and we recognize that we're on the cutting edge to then translate these things into viable care to help those who suffer and yet be equally legally and ethically responsible for the very real possibility that side effects might pop up to five, ten years down the line that were unanticipated because we simply didn't know yet the way the brain works or the way these particular techniques and technologies would interact with the brain. Is the benefit worth the burden? Or as one of my esteemed colleagues, Dave Reese, likes to say, is that juice worth the squeeze? And I think in a lot of ways it is, but only because there's great power to help there. And if I can paraphrase Faust, with great power comes great responsibility. So the neuroethical question is, are we in fact ready to accept the responsibility? Who will shoulder that responsibility? And how shall we move ahead in such a way that is not only scientifically prudent, but ethical, legally sound as well? And that remains a work in progress. And, and this is applicable certainly to the community of research and application that that might fall, psychiatry, neuroscience, medicine, et cetera. But uh, perhaps I'm extending it, and I'm sure you might agree, the genie's out of the bottle, so to speak. And it, at this point, I think we all realize with the availability of information and the interaction of that information, uh, rather than be uncomfortable with it, I think the average person, while not getting to certainly your level, we need to be aware and educate ourselves and pay attention to it. And that, I think, in itself will give a, not just a greater understanding, but alleviate or at least identify some of the areas that people feel are threatened. And it leaves less room for that fear that they're going to take me away. I'll lose my free will. I'll be identified. I'll be a set of numbers in a behavioral software program. And, uh, and that diminishes them. And I think the educational aspect of what's available at whatever level you may choose to seek it, I think that might set a lot of people at ease, at least with regard to what may be available and what applications that might have and how they wish to approach it. I think that might be especially helpful in the legal perspective, getting a, a bit of a view now so that down the road, no one is shocked to hear something and they say, oh, they made a law doing what? Because sometimes laws are passed willy-nilly, and, and I can see how that could be You're impossible. absolutely right. It, it, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Kevin. You know, I, I, the, the long-standing idea that learning must precede change, else what will happen is change will, in fact, engage fear, is so applicable in this scenario. Uh, part of it is that I think there's, there's general misunderstandings, and in some cases, some frank miscommunications about what neuroscience and neurotechnology actually can do and what the limitations are and what neuroscience and neurotechnology cannot do. But as we mentioned earlier, I think there's also a set of expectations about what we, as groups of individuals, as defined communities, as institutions, and even as body politic, 
will do with this neuroscience and technology, irrespective of what the actual limitations of the science and technology really may be. And the idea of taking it out of context and using it in a way that are exaggerated or in some cases even inappropriate. These represent real fears. Also the fear that there's no one in control, so to speak. That this is just science spinning out of control in some Archimedean spiral of its own sustenation. Uh, that's not exactly true, of course. There are relative bodies that produce guidelines and attempt to govern and at very, very least uh, direct the scope, tenor, and progress of what these neuroscientific and neurotechnological advancements are. And I'm proud to say I'm, I'm a member of that community that, that strives to do that. So the issue here really is one that I like to refer to as in-step. We like to keep science and technology in step with ethics, philosophy, and practice, and policies. We want to make sure, of course, that as always, we recognize that science and technology leads. And the reason for that is simple. It always has led, it always will lead. Those changes occur much more rapidly very often because we anticipate that what we're going to do with the science and technology is beneficial, is for the good. And then it's only after, as you well said, the genie is out of the bottle and the cat is out of the bag that we get the uh-oh, and then we begin to confront potential burdens, harms, and real risks. So what we tend to find is that in the past, let's say 25, 35, 50 years ago, the pace of science and technology was such that we could adopt something of a precautionary principle. If we thought that the burdens were greater than the benefits, let's just stop for a while. We can't do that anymore. And there are two reasons for that. Number one is that neuroscience and neurotechnologies are occurring increasingly on a global scale. It's not just a, a superpowered devotion to this type of science and technology, but neuroscience and technology can and will be used to leverage global economies ever more. Uh, countries, for example, not only such as the United States and other Western nations, but uh, increasingly China, India, and North Korea, uh, Brazil, Russia, and small individual research groups that are subsidized by venture capital are making great advancements in neuroscientific and neurotechnological research in their applications. So what we're seeing is a worldwide or globalized phenomenon, very, very difficult to stop such things and take a frankly precautionary stance. Instead, what we urge is a more preparatory stance, recognizing that this pendulum of scientific and technological progress will occur, as specifically the brain sciences, and in so doing, try to align the idea of uh, philosophical, ethical, legal, and social preparedness, anticipation, and in that way, guidance, direction, and in some cases, governance of what the science and technology can do. Thus, the acronym in step, integrated science, technology, education, and policies. The education piece is critical. And I must tell you that uh, in some ways, to sort of assuage the worries of the listening audience, this is not just my rambling. The idea of a, a much more forthright, proactive approach to educating not only the professionals who are involved in the field of science, technology, ethics, philosophy, policy, and law, but bringing up the public awareness so as to create much more of uh, an informed public in the spirit of caveat emptor, so as to decrease unnecessary anxieties and also to mitigate and balance unnecessary or expanded anticipations about what the science and technology can do is really part of the mission of 21st century neuroscience and neuroethics. I have the pleasure of working with my colleague in the UK, Dr. Malcolm Dando, to instantiate this worldwide program in neuroscientific, neurotechnological, and neuroethical education on a variety of levels, certainly within academia, uh, literally from the pre-high school all the way up to formalized programs that look at these issues in the professional fields, but also as part of the new worldview, a sort of more neuroscientifically informed Weltanschauung, if you will, a, a worldview that incorporates neuroscience and neurotechnology as at least one of the viable spirits of the time that must be built upon a fairly broad public exposure, rationale, communication, and at least generalized understanding of what neuroscience seeks to do, can do, cannot do, 
and what we as individuals, groups, publics, and perhaps even a population should do with the tools we have, the knowledge we possess, and that which we lack. And that's a fabulous overview, and that couldn't have summed it up any better. I think that's an excellent way to approach it as a totality. Uh, To boil that down, I guess, simply, uh, the old expression, uh, get up to speed, uh, Mm -hmm. that's things are changing so fast, uh, you better be at speed in order to get up to speed, it sounds like. So in that simplified expression, what would be a good way, maybe not the best or maybe a starter, how would the general public or someone concerned about this or someone who wants more start off maybe intermediately look, and of course the higher levels are are probably available to those who are already in the field. Where would someone start and say, I'm going to go to this conference, read this book, find this site. Um, What's a good way for someone to ease into this and at least get even the terminology down so they're not listening to something or seeing it on TV and going, what the heck is that? Sure. You know, fortunately, we have both the blessing and the curse of the Internet. And let me explain what I mean by that. The blessing of the Internet is that it is a ton of information literally at our fingertips. <laughs> the curse of the Internet is that there's a ton of information at our fingertips. And so how do we create an educated consumer who's going into the Internet, relatively uneducated, to be able to parse through the reams of information so as to cull out Uh, that misinformation that may not be applicable, that may then spool up into these exaggerated claims or unnecessary anxieties. Well, I think there are a number of ways of doing this. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that is important is to go to what I would call only uh, stringent academic sites on the Internet. Uh, there, There are plenty of people who are blogging about neuroscience and neurotechnology, and I must tell you, of course, I'm one of them, and several of them are quite good. I don't really think I'm in a position right now to recommend that individuals go to any one particular blog site. But one thing I would recommend that people do is look at where certain blog sites are co-registered and co-listed. If they're affiliated, for example, with a large university center or an international organization, chances are that blog is going to be pretty good and there's some real value and validity to what's being posted there. It's, It's not just opinion. Not that there's no value in opinion, but I think it's not a good place to start. You want to start with some relative appropriation of the current factual basis that's out there and then work your way up. I think there are a number of very good informational sites that are available both on the Internet and through a number of print media. So, for example, um, there is the journal Neuroethics, which is published by the publishing house Springer. There is the journal, the American Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience, which also provides great insight to the field of neuroscience and neuroethics. And it too is available online. There are a number of journals in the Biomed Central online stable that are dealing with neuroethical issues. And these are all open and available to the reader without without fee. Uh, some of the Springer journals may have a nominal cost, but in reality, none more than one would pay, for example, for a, a magazine or a book. Of course, there are a number of very good books on the field of neuroscience and neuroethics, and I think any one of those books that is published by a good academic press or a good scholarly press will provide a nice foothold on the field. Some are more advanced than others. Um, but I think that a reader can sort of go to a bookstore, particularly a scientific bookstore, crack a couple of books, and in a short amount of time be able to figure out what level of erudition they're working at, what's too complicated, what's not. I also think that they can utilize the Internet as a resource to get in touch with certain organizations and groups that are actually doing this kind of work. Uh, Certainly in a very proud and, and yet humble way, um, our Center for Neurotechnology Studies here at the Institute uh, lays, a, I think, a pretty good claim to advancing neuroscientific, neurotechnological, and neuroethical information to the public through the lecture series that we began talking about when, when you introduced me. That's our Capital Consortium of Neuroethics, Legal, and Social Issues series and our, and our annual Neuroethics, Legal, and Social Issues Symposium. The International Neuroethics Society and the Society for Neurosciences are also very viable resources. There's the American Association for Neuro Law that looks at the way neuroscience might be leverageable within uh, courts of law, within the legal structure. 
And so what we know is that there are a number of really fine resources that are out there. And my recommendation would be that the audience and your listening public see what's on the internet and then also try to discern which ones are more affiliated with major academic research centers because those are the ones that are going to hold a, a little more water. Again, not, not to say that opinion and perspective is not important, but you really want to set up a, a strong foundation of understanding what the field is all about. Uh, moreover, I mean, let's face it, I, I'd be more than happy to address uh, members of the, of the listening audience's question directly, and of course they can, they can find me online. Just, they can just Google Dr. James Giordano or neurobioethics and they can find me. And we like to have public forum frequently here at our institute, as do a number of other institutes across the country. Um, there's the group at the University of Pennsylvania that has their neuroscience and society program. There's a wonderful program at, at NYU. There's a great program at Stanford University. So there are, there are programs um, across the country. So again, for your listening audience, um, the internet is a great place to start, and that can then help them to navigate to those programs that tend to be most affiliated with um, academic institutions that will really substantiate the information that's available to them. Excellent uh, suggestions, and uh, even to put that in a local perspective, I, I know here in Alaska, the university is right here, and certainly stopping in and finding out what is available for being able to contact people or get information, or perhaps many of these are locally put on by uh, faculty and staff, open education, if you will, or a topic being presented. And there's certainly things that can be done at any university where you can find these out, go in, sit down, sort of get a almost an audit in a capsule of a class and be brought at least into the fore for what's going on. And uh, I think that's a valuable asset, too. A lot of this is community available. It's, it's all freely put out by academics and universities who seek to have more people aware of it. They're interested in their field, and that's why they've become involved in it. Let me hit on one more thing here, and that is it would be great to have in the future, I'll invite you here, we'll pick a time perhaps uh, in the near or whatever is convenient for your future, and it would be good if you'd like to have a call-in show. We'll have a brief intro and uh, perhaps open it to questions. Uh, I would love that. That's something that I really enjoy doing. I think far too long, those of us who've worked in neuroscience, technology, and neuroethics, have existed within the, the relative silos of uh, the ivory tower. But, you know, increasingly through uh, the wonders of shows such as yours and the Internet and blog radio sites, etc., that, that silo has been cracked. And I think that the best way for the public to gain the information they need is to ask questions of those people who are actually doing the work. And I would be both pleased and honored to be a part of such a thing. Dr. James Giordano, thank you so much for being on the show. I've learned a lot. Let me ask you, just as we're closing, if you would give your site address so that people can stop in and see what you're doing and uh, certainly have more awareness of what you've been speaking about today. Our website here at the Potomac Institute is www.potomacinstitute, that's P-O-T-O-M-A-C-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E dot org. Get onto the website and navigate to the Center for Neurotechnology Studies. To my website, which is www.neurobioethics.org. Feel free to contact me at jgiordano at neurobioethics.org. It's been our pleasure and our privilege to have you on. Thank you so much. All right, this is Dr. Kevin McGuire, closing another edition of Men Matter. We invite our listeners to come and participate in the email and call in that we'll set up for the future. Elizabeth Catherine Kyle, this is Dad. I love you with all my heart. All right, we'll see everyone again on our next show. Thank you for joining us. Bye for now. Papa, I don't think I've said I love you near enough. The leader of the band is tired and his eyes are growing old. His blood runs through my hands. Song is in my soul.